My name is Matthijs Bouw. I'm an architect and urban planner. I have a firm in Amsterdam called One Architecture. Um, and I try to, um, I'll, I'll start with the beginning and how I came to study architecture. Um, I spent my high school years living in New York City and I realized that I didn't want to go to an American college because it would make me an American. And uh, so I had to go to Europe and in Europe you don't have the liberal arts where you have a chance to explore a bit what you can do. So you have to choose. And I've always been um, very good at math and physics and I decided that it was time to do something else so I wanted to go to art school. So I applied to art school and they said, well, can you bring your portfolio? And I said, what's a portfolio? Because I never had anything to do with it. And I discovered that while it was impossible for someone who was versed in mathematics and physics only um, to become a uh, to enter into an art school, I could enter into architecture school. And that, of course, at the Technical University in Delft, made things relatively easy because I know that being in the environment of a technical university, if I turn to be not creative at all, uh, which I still haven't discovered if I'm creative at all, but I could always fall back on whatever uh, that environment had to, had to offer. And I, th I think this um, interest in um, mathematics and physics um, has always been very influential in how, how I also start to think, started to think of architecture and of urban planning. Um, because once you get a bit further ahead in mathematics, you start to understand all these different mathematical systems and you start to get a sense of the fact that um, the continuity that we think, for instance, in space, which is like something that we've all been taught in the 20th century architecture school, is not really there. It's a construct. And if you look at the history of architecture, it's in a way also a construct. It's something that the whole notion of space as this thing that encompasses everything and where everything meets is like philosophically a notion from the maybe late 19th century or something like that. And, and I think um, um, for me, um, uh, mathematics and being sort of okay with it and with statistics or system theory or topology or all these different fields has really helped me become the architect and planner that I am, which is what I have sometimes a sense a bit different from the way many other people practice. Profession. Like, I can understand uh, the frustration. I also think it's not necessarily uh, needs to be a frustration, but what happened in the, in the mid 90s, we understand now. We opened up our credit lines and we started privatizing. And that made our economy boom temporarily, of course, because in 2008 we discovered that we've been living in a bubble. And we were the first European country to do that. We were the first European country to make sure that the Christian Democrats, with all their dogma about how we should live, were put to the margins politically, and that created a freedom and a financial possibilities for architecture. Um, and then we also happened to have the greatest architect in the world live in our country. Um, and uh, employing many people who then had spin-offs, etc. So it was a fantastic time to be an architect. Um, all this stuff, of course, is best documented in the book or and even in the words Super Dutch. And in, um, in Super Dutch, there's a, like, a sort of epilogue, and there are four offices in the epilogue, uh, 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 people that Bart Lootsma, the author of Super Dutch, doesn't know yet how to place and uh, my firm is there called one of the most idiosyncratic uh, offices. Um, on the one hand we came into being on the Super Dutch and we're friends with all these people but we're also much younger and um, we're, we're like, like the, the, the kids uh, and, and what 
resulted that what that resulted in is that we because we were so young compared to all these cool people who were seven years older than we were um, that we would never get work because all the cool people who were seven years older would get the work we were like 26 or 32 or like too young to get work as an architect uh, so while well, basically we were stamped uh, or I think it's time stim uh, stimmed as the people from super dutch we never profited from it which is great because that meant that uh, we also could still chart our own um, idiosyncrasies uh, in, a, in a very nice uh, way. So we profited a, a bit from the climate in the cultural sense and from having wonderful people around us. Um, but we are too odd to profit from it commercially, which now uh, makes me incredibly happy because I see how by necessity, many of the bigger offices uh, out of the Super Dutch <laughs> had to become much more corporate in order to survive in a post-crisis environment. Um, and, and we didn't suffer because we could just sort of navigate being relatively small, doing our own little niche work, uh, the, uh, the terrain. And that's, that's, that's okay. I think it's very interesting to see how after uh, Super Dutch, uh, for instance, we have had the Super Danes, who had a similar thing. Uh, a, a lot of things uh, 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 became much more freer and the credit uh, 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 was flowing. And uh, they also had some very talented uh, 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 people. And I like it very much that the Danes managed to steal the Dutch. They stole our windmills, they stole our biking, they stole our architecture. And, um, and, and, uh, uh, and that's great. And I'm really looking forward, I'm forward to see what will be the next uh, uh, theft, the big, uh, the big theft. Um, I don't know. Yeah, that's funny. Um, maybe to... What I like, uh, let me then get back to what we see here and why I feel an affinity with, with between, let's say, the work that you're doing and, um, and what I like to do, it, there's a sort of embrace of, um, let's say, disconnectedness, of disjointness. There's an embrace of failure. There's an embrace of the, the, the fact that, uh, if, that, that by accepting failure, by accepting disconnectedness, you create much more open structures that other people can start entering and dreaming away with or using as their own tools and it works in, in, a, in a poetic way but it also works very much in when you do urban planning or this, this sort of whole concept of, of saying don't over organize, don't over control, don't try to bring everything together in space to go back to where we started is, is something that um, I really find that uh, we need to learn much better and much more about as architects because if we want to be part of this messy world we need to sort of have this openness, not openness in an ideological sense but in the sense that by, um, by knowing how to stutter well and knowing how to deal with our pus and, and, and and accepting that, that things might not work or whatever, uh, that, that through that we, we can be part of a much larger, much messier world that, uh, and really operate in it.